Despite important advances in technological innovation, today's world is still plagued by rampant inequality, starvation, and disease. Instead of racing to end these injustices, society has been told by numerous experts that our priorities must instead focus on managing overpopulation and saving natural ecosystems from the destructive effects of human action. Adapting to scarcity is the best we are told to expect, while green energy systems have been sold as the only permissible pathway into the future. But could it be possible that those very remedies which we have been sold are actually much worse than the problems they profess to cure? Could our ignorance over energy science and its relationship to supporting human life be resulting in a plunge into the eye of a vast storm that threatens to engulf modern civilization as we know it? It is interesting to note that in most post-apocalyptic stories featured in cinemas, television, and bookstores across the United States and Europe, dystopic scenarios are commonly featured with worlds suffering, starvation, and a lack of basic resources. Within these scenarios, this scarcity necessarily induces conflicts over resources, as evidenced by the more recent popular dystopic theme of water wars. However, amidst these various scenarios, Access to energy has rarely been depicted as one of those basic resources shaping future conflicts, as heroic characters in dystopic films always seem to have access to sufficient supplies of energy. The themes of guerrilla hackers, gamers, or tech scavengers combating the evil establishment come up again and again, yet we rarely ask the question, from where does their energy come from? In other words, out of all of the basic resources to our health and what contributes to the quality and longevity of our lives, energy is the most important basic resource that will determine to what degree we live an empowered life versus a disempowered one. Without energy, we live largely poor and destitute lives. All we need to do is look at a satellite image of the Earth at night to see how strikingly true this is. It is a fact that access to energy determines whether a nation and its people are considered living in a first world, second world, or third world condition. Just the fact that we use such categorizations should reveal to us how far we have come in accepting and even normalizing that such categories exist and will continue to exist. The question is, do they need to? And are we shaping our energy policies in a way that is in fact ever widening this gap? the gap between the energy rich and the energy poor. In this light, we have already been experiencing for several decades what could be viewed as energy wars, and it is only relatively recently that the Western world has begun to feel its effects, though much of the rest of the world has been very aware of its ongoing presence. This is only a recent revelation for the Western world since it is only as of late that we are now also being told that there is simply not enough energy to go around, not even for the first world, and that we cannot provide abundant energy without some very large sacrifices. Europe and the United States have announced their goal which has now also been made into law in the case of Europe their legally binding pledge to become climate neutral by 2050 with zero carbon emissions and a 50% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. In a following episode, we will discuss these policies in relation to climate and agriculture. In this episode, we will focus on what is to be the outcome of these energy policies in the West in terms of the livelihood of the Western people, as well as what it will mean for those in the world who already have access to very little, if any, energy. It has long been understood that access to energy plays a deciding role in the Social Progress Index. 
In other words, whether a country will have a poor to average to high living standard. This includes access to the best medical care, more nutritious food, access to clean water, and adequate shelter. In other words, a high energy country is a rich country. It is important for us here to look into what an energy poor life consists of, not just for the reason that we cannot address what we do not understand, but it is also imperative since our policies in the West are increasingly advocating a decrease in energy production and energy use in energy rich countries as well. For us to truly comprehend what this will mean as a measurable outcome and what sort of sacrifices are in fact being asked of a large portion of the Western population, we need to look at areas of the world who are already living varying degrees of energy poor lives. Today, over 3 billion people use almost no energy, including electricity, with 1.2 billion having access to no energy at all. To put this disparity of energy use between energy rich and energy poor regions of the world into further context, one refrigerator uses about 1,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. Thus, one refrigerator uses more electricity per year than roughly 3 billion people. Energy is not just about comfort or convenience, but it is literally a matter of life or death. Here is a story from a Western woman who visited Gambia, one of the many African countries that desperately lack energy. At 4 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, I was startled when the lights came on. The lights never came on after 2 p.m. on the weekends. The adrenaline really kicked in when I was invited to observe an emergency C-section, a first for me. When the infant emerged, I felt my heart racing from excitement and awe. But no matter how many times the technician suctioned out the nose and mouth, the infant didn't utter a sound. After 25 minutes, the technician and nurse both gave up. The surgeon later explained that the baby had suffocated in utero. If only they had had enough power to use the ultrasound machine for each pregnancy, he would have detected the problem earlier and been able to plan the C-section. Without early detection, the C-section became an emergency. Moreover, the surgery had to wait for the generator to be powered on. The loss of precious minutes meant the loss of a precious life. At that time, in that place, all I could do was cry. And later, I cried again. A full-term infant was born weighing three and a half pounds. In the United States, the solution would have been obvious and effective, incubation. But without reliable electricity, the hospital did not even contemplate owning an incubator. This seemingly simple solution was not available to this newborn girl, and she perished needlessly. Reliable electricity is at the forefront of every staff member's thoughts. Without it, they will continue to give their patients the best care available. But in a country with an average life expectancy of only 54 years of age, it's a hard fight to win. This sort of tragedy occurs in many parts of the world on a daily basis. However, thankfully, it is occurring less and less frequently due to an increase in affordable, reliable energy, otherwise known as energy derived from coal, oil, and natural gas. The reality that we are often not told about is that coal, oil, and natural gas energy use is what is ultimately deciding the social progress index amongst most nations in the world today, including the first world countries. This is because it is still by far the most affordable, reliable, and efficient energy. We can see this most strikingly in the case of both China and India, countries that were once energy poor who have increased their access to energy use. In the case of China, they have now exceeded the life expectancy of the United States due to their increased use in coal, oil, and natural gas energy, as well as nuclear and hydro. With China now experiencing a life expectancy of 77.5 years, and the United States with a decreased life expectancy of 76.1 years, the reason for China now superseding the United States in longevity is due to their access to energy. Though the case of India has improved markedly, there are still many in India who lack access to significant energy. About one-third of all Indians live in poverty, with about 300 million, 
nearly the size of the entire American population, having zero access to electricity. In fact, within many places in developing Asia as well as Africa, the burning of wood and dung are still the primary sources of energy. Wood and dung are used to cook food using indoor biomass stoves. This has also created a tragic situation of a great deal of needless loss of life. Every year in India alone, there are more than one million people who die from indoor air pollution. University of California Berkeley professor Kirk Smith estimates the health impact of cooking with biomass is akin to burning 400 cigarettes per hour in your kitchen. However, incredibly, there are many in the West who advocate that dung and wood continue to be used as primary energy sources rather than these regions having access to the affordable and much cleaner energy from coal, oil, and natural gas. Promoting this as a centuries-old practice and thus somehow an acceptable standard of living for these people. What we are really saying is that it is all right if billions of people, estimated to be about 3 billion, live a life where there is no change, no improvement to their living standard, whereas in other parts of the world we view basic human rights to include access to medical care, access to clean air, and access to clean water. If we truly believe these are essential human rights, we have no place in promoting wood and dung fuel use in the energy-poor regions of the world as something that is acceptable or even sustainable, since does sustainable mean an acceptance of premature death and a greatly shortened lifespan? Let alone the fact that it is the women and young girls who are relegated to spending most of the day, every day, collecting wood, dung, and water, only to slowly poison themselves to death as they prepare the meals for the entire family. This is not an empowered life. It is a disempowered one, where individuals have no choice but to slave at menial tasks just to survive. In such a world, there is no opportunity, there is no real future. Thus, what is often not said is that the quality of energy use will determine whether there is human flourishing versus unnecessary hardship and suffering along with premature death. This is what it means to have access to affordable, efficient energy for most of the world. It is truly a matter of life or death, as well as a life with a future versus no future. The total world population is 8.1 billion, with 1.5 billion people using one-third the electrical energy of an average American, and 3 billion with access to hardly any electrical energy, if at all. Incredibly, despite 37% of the world population using as much power as a single refrigerator does in one year, we are telling these disempowered regions of the world that we cannot afford increasing their living standard through access to affordable, efficient energy. Ultimately, if you think about all the youth that everybody's mentioned here in Africa, if everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car, and everybody's got air conditioning, and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over. It could not be made any more clear. It is considered intolerable for energy-poor countries to choose for themselves an increase in their standard of living through affordable energy, since, according to former President Barack Obama, the planet will boil over, and thus, what are these regions of the world expected to do? Well, they are expected to continue living the way they have been for centuries, since these new ways of producing energy that Mr. Obama mentions cost trillions upon trillions of dollars. According to this viewpoint, the first, second, and third worlds must remain so, since we cannot allow for the planet to boil over, can we? For now, the logic is that the first world can afford the new energy that costs trillions of dollars, but the disempowered worlds can only have access to affordable, efficient energy, that is, coal, oil, and natural gas. What we used in the West to become wealthy, empowered first world nations, but now we are told these affordable energies will no longer be allowed. What will be the consequence of such a policy? Will we save the earth and its people from environmental destruction and lift up impoverished nations with clean energy? Or will we instead see a much more striking increase in poverty and disempowerment in the world, as well as a much higher death rate? 
since these policies are effectively stating that these regions of the world must drastically decrease their energy access, effectively banning coal, oil, and natural gas. They will primarily be reliant on wood and dung fuel. Such a policy is very clearly advocating and justifying that there will be millions of people in the world who will have to die. However, will it be only the disempowered energy poor world who will be made to sacrifice dearly? We should take a look into how these new ways of producing energy are meant to function from our first world policies as well. Since the European Union has proclaimed themselves to be the world leaders in committing to zero carbon emissions by 2050 and a 55% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030, making this into law, let us look at how the EU is leading the world into this green transition. This transition is to be achieved through a move from the cheap and affordable energies of coal, oil and natural gas, the very foundation for what has created energy-rich nations, to renewable energies and biofuels. When the energy crisis hit Europe in 2021 due to political reasons and not anything pertaining to natural scarcity, EU climate czar Franz Timmermans declared in his opening remarks at the Fit for 55 discussion on October 6, 2021. I want to say clearly that had we had the Green Deal five years ago, we would not be in this position. Then we would have much more renewable energy of which the prices are consistently low and we would not be this dependent on fossil fuels from outside of the European Union. Thus, Mr. Timmermans was asserting that had the Green Deal been implemented five years earlier in 2016, then Europe would not be in the energy crisis it is in today. This is a problematic statement on multiple levels. The largest one being that if Europe is experiencing an energy crisis, does it make sense to reduce the energy availability even more? By making policy actions to reduce affordable energy, by actively shutting down coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear production, while there is presently an inability for renewable and biofuel to replace these energies, what will be the logical outcome? An even greater energy deficit. Mr. Timmermans and those advocating for the 2030 and 2050 goals are shutting down reliable energy before the new energy forms are online. Does this not seem incredibly reckless? that during an energy crisis, policies pushed forward are in fact increasing the energy deficit. For months, the EU has been embroiled in an energy crisis, with the fallout of Russia's invasion of Ukraine leading to a highly volatile prices. Europe's winter is well underway, and with the uncertainty around gas and electricity supplies, there's been increased demand for firewood as an alternative fuel source. But that's prompting worries over the future of the continent's forests. There is also another troubling aspect to Mr. Timmermans' statement. There has already been unprecedented investment into the green transition. According to Bloomberg, the world invested unprecedented amounts in low-carbon assets in the year 2020, a record $501.1 billion, beating the previous year by 9%, despite this overlapping with the COVID-19 pandemic. Head analyst of Bloomberg, NEF, reported, our figures show that the world has reached half a trillion dollars a year in its investment to decarbonize the energy system. Clean power generation and electric transport are seeing heavy inflows, but need to see further increases in spending as costs fall. We need to be talking about trillions per year if we are to meet climate goals. According to another Bloomberg report, Private equity has been in the process of ditching coal, oil, and natural gas since 2017. In other words, serious investment into transitioning towards green energy started five years prior to Mr. Timmermans' speech, the magic number Timmermans referred to as if it wasn't actually happening. What both graphs demonstrate is that there has been a bountiful investment into acceptable green energy, in fact, trillions. But apparently this is not enough before we start to see an actual payout in energy supplies. Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of Canada and former director of the Bank of England, and now the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, announced at COP26 that 
An estimated $100 trillion of investment would be needed over the next three decades for a clean energy future. That is an incredible amount of money. There are several issues with this statement. Why does this clean energy market require such an exorbitant amount of financing? For countries that cannot afford these costs, what are they expected to do? Why are we being told that it will not be until three decades from now that we will see the energy market stabilized? And why are non-renewable energy supplies being rapidly taken down if the timeline to be fully operational using green energy is 30 years from now? Where is the energy going to come from in the meantime during this so-called transition phase? Let us start with the exorbitant cost. A major cost factor to these acceptable CARNI-approved green energies is that they have a much lower capacity factor than non-renewables, most notably than that of nuclear. Capacity factor measures the actual generation of energy compared to the maximum amount it could potentially generate in a given period without any interruption. Therefore, when you hear things like X number of solar plants or wind turbines can generate the same amount of energy as one nuclear plant, be wary, since they are using the maximum potential energy output. In other words, sunny all 24 hours of a day with no clouds, high winds 24-7 rather than factoring in the capacity factor. What a nuclear plant promises, it delivers. This is not the case with wind and solar, the effects of which we are seeing in Europe presently. Note, in the graph, solar panels are shown to have a maximum capacity factor of 24.9%, but that is really quite generous. Depending on the solar panel you are using, the capacity factor typically ranges from 17 to 23%. Wind also has a capacity factor that often is lower than the generous 35.4% shown. In the case of Ontario, Canada, wind energy's capacity factor averages 27%. Also, according to the Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration in 2009, the average capacity factor for coal plants was 63.8%. What this means is that if your country requires X gigawatts of energy to sustain itself, and if you are using solar or wind at a capacity factor of 25%, then you would need to build four times the number of solar or wind plants than what you would theoretically need in order to receive 100% of that promised energy output. In other words, the potential maximum energy output they use to promote their products as competitors to non-renewables. Thus, when claims are made that solar panels are the cheapest form of energy, they are not accounting for the capacity factor, and at best, the cost is actually four times, and at worst, six times higher than what they are actually claiming on paper. However, this is still not accounting for all of the costs. Both solar and wind also have the extra cost of battery storage and a fully functioning energy grid for periods where there is no solar and wind activity. This energy grid is most often backed by coal, oil, or natural gas energy, otherwise by nuclear or hydro. Thus, so far, there is no energy structure that can exist solely off of renewable energy. In fact, in places where renewables have been more heavily implemented, there is still an inability to reduce coal, oil, and natural gas use by even 50%. This calls into question whether it is even possible to reduce carbon emissions in half by 2030 if renewables are still ultimately dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas, the only other alternative energies being nuclear and hydro. Germany, who is regarded as the leading nation pushing forward the climate-neutral goals of 2050, boasts of 45% gross renewable energy, but this is not telling the full story. In a 2021 study, the Fraunhofer Institute estimated Germany must install at least six to eight times present solar capacity in order to reach 100% carbon-free goals by 2045, with estimated costs reaching into the trillions. The report says that the present gross 54 gigawatts solar capacity must increase to 544 gigawatts by 2045. That would mean a land space of 3,568,000 acres, 1.4 million hectares, which is more than 16,000 square kilometers of solid solar panels across the country, 
This is not even including all the wind stations. Farmland and forests will be destroyed and paved, all for so-called environmentally friendly, though unreliable and incredibly expensive, solar and wind renewables. In the midst of food shortages, due to the energy crisis which has reduced fertilizer production, Europeans are also being told that they need to severely cut down on farmland to make way for the new farms of solar panels and windmills. In addition, solar panels present a very serious toxic waste situation with no readily available solutions, unlike the case of nuclear, which we will discuss in another episode. The International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA's official projections assert that large amounts of annual waste are anticipated by the early 2030s and could total 78 million tons by the year 2050 in solar panel waste. Harvard Business Review reported, if early replacements occur as predicted by our statistical model, they can produce 50 times more waste in just four years than IRENA anticipates. That figure translates to around 315,000 metric tons of waste, based on an estimate of 90 tons per megawatt weight to power ratio. Alarming as they are, these stats may not do full justice to the crisis, as our analysis is restricted to residential installations. With commercial and industrial panels added to the picture, the scale of replacements could be much, much larger. The Harvard Business Review adds that solar panel industry does not actually have a plan to deal with the massive amount of toxic waste that nations will have to deal with 10 years from now, adding that although the financial incentive for funding the production of solar panels is high, there is little financial incentive in figuring out what to do with the waste. Harvard Business Review writes, By 2035, discarded panels would outweigh new units sold by 2.56 times. In turn, this would catapult the LCOE, levelized costs of energy, a measure of the overall cost of an energy-producing asset over its lifetime, to four times the current projection. The economics of solar, so bright-seeming from the vantage point of 2021, would darken quickly as the industry sinks under the weight of its own trash. Thus again, there are massive hidden costs in solar panels that presently do not account for the cost of managing its own waste at astronomical prices. But the fallbacks do not end there. Europe and North America will require huge volumes of steel and concrete to build the expected millions of solar panels and wind farms. How are the materials steel and concrete produced? By coal and nuclear energy. Steel and concrete production is so energy intensive that solar and wind energy are not actually sufficient to produce their own parts. Thus, renewables do not only rely on coal, oil, and natural gas for their backup energy sources, but they also rely on coal and nuclear for manufacturing their actual parts. So what is going on? Why are we pushing for goals that are apparently impossible to meet? Why would the EU and the United States shut down their energy without the ability to replace a substantial portion of it with renewables? And why does it seem like so many places in the world have achieved great success in transitioning to renewables? Take the example of Vermont State, which has one of the greenest grids in the United States with two-thirds of their electricity coming from renewables and with the plan to reach 75% by 2032. However, what Vermont has come to recently discover is that reaching this goal is not just a matter of building solar and wind farms, but it is also about the limitations to their electrical grid. In northern Vermont, where there are not so many inhabitants, it was thought that much of the area could be filled with renewable energy farms. However, they hit their limit a few years back when they had reached the grid's electrical capacity, which is 450 megawatts. If we want more renewable energy, we'll have to build more solar and wind farms. However, if we want to be able to actually use that energy, more high-voltage transmission lines will also need to be built. This is not as easy of a feat as it first sounds. This is the population density of the United States. And this is where every big power plant is currently, which tends to be located in the areas of heaviest population density. As we can see from the map, there is still a complete dependence on non-renewable energy in heavily populated regions. 
In the case of Washington, D.C., nearly all of their electricity comes from surrounding states' power plants, mostly nuclear and natural gas. President Biden has put forward the goal to reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 and for 45% of all electricity to come from solar plants by 2050. Lowering emissions will also entail a transfer over to electric cars and away from gas cars, heating our buildings with electric heat pumps rather than natural gas, cooking on electric stoves instead of gas stoves. In other words, we are going to be using a lot more electricity than we currently have been. However, if we want to meet these electrical needs through renewable energy, we will not be able to build solar and wind plants where former coal, nuclear, or natural gas plants were located, but rather they will have to be built where they can receive the most sun and wind. This is a map created by Princeton University where wind and solar projects could, in theory, be built, which are mostly located in the middle of the United States. Another study made similar conclusions that the area marked in green would be able to supply 88% of wind energy demands and 56% of solar energy demands, totaling a potential of meeting energy demands according to the 2050 climate neutral goals. However, the people living in this region would only require 30% of this electricity. Thus, in order to meet the 2050 climate neutral goals, there needs to be a capability of transferring the electricity from here to here. This is a lot of electricity we are talking about here. Approximately 58% of the entire country's electricity needs, which will require the need to construct a lot of high voltage transmission lines. According to the Princeton study, more than double what the United States currently has. This is problematic on several fronts, the most obvious one being that coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear energy will be required to build these transmission towers that will require massive amounts of steel, on top of the massive quantities that will be needed for wind and solar plants, which also will need energy from coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear, since they cannot be made without these higher density energies. The other issue with these towers is that they, unlike regular transmission lines, use a bare wire. The reason why these transmission lines need to use a bare wire is because they will need to carry electricity for much greater distances than they currently do. This is because, as already explained, most of the solar and wind plants will be located in the middle of the United States, which is a great distance from the most densely populated city centers. Presently, we use alternating current which cannot travel efficiently over long distances. By the time it reaches its destination point, we will have lost most of the initial energy generated. With high voltage direct current, we can deliver the electricity with minimal loss. The downside to this is that we need to use bare wire. These wires are insulated by the air and must be kept far enough apart from each other. Otherwise, the consequences are extremely dangerous. Thus, building a massive array of high-voltage bare wire transmission lines will mean that there cannot be any trees anywhere near these power lines, which risks exploding if they come into contact with branches or even leaves. In fact, this is how some of the California wildfires were started. To meet the electricity needs Americans will require to reach the climate-neutral goal of 2050, these transmission lines will actually have to be increased in size, since bigger lines mean more electricity transferred. The bigger the lines, the further apart and taller the towers will need to be, which means they will require more bare land and more materials such as steel, which requires energy from coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear energies. This will mean that a great deal of the forests in the United States will need to be cut down since bare land will be needed for the solar and wind plants, and bare land will also be needed for these high voltage transmission lines, and there will be many of them. It is hard to think where forests can exist in this envisioned climate neutral world. These transmission lines can also experience overload, which again is extremely dangerous, not to mention costly, with massive setbacks to delivering electricity to these regions. 
Presently, there is the push in policy to build these massive transmission lines before we have the solar and wind plants even online, since, theoretically, it takes one year to build one solar generation project, whereas it takes three to ten years to build the transmission lines for these projects. There should be a very clear irony developing at this point. How are we to lower our carbon emissions when the projects that are supposedly going to help us reach these goals are in fact going to require more energy use from coal, oil, and natural gas? With only nuclear and hydro plants being able to cover these needs as carbon-free energies, yet the United States is in the process of shutting down their nuclear and hydro plants, not building more. How are we to reduce carbon emissions in half by the year 2030 when these projects that are carbon energy dependent will take up to 10 years just to achieve the first stage of development? And how can a world free of carbon emissions be maintained if the production of carbon-free renewables requires higher energy density fuels that can only be met by coal, oil, natural gas, hydro, or nuclear? In other words, this is an impossible goal to reach by 2030 and 2050. In fact, it is an impossible goal, period. The present plan to generate solar and wind plants with massive transmission lines will require more carbon-based energies for their production, not less. This is not a zero-carbon self-sufficient plan, and it will come at the cost of wiping out massive forests and farmland areas, and we are doing this for what will ultimately increase our use of carbon-based energies? There is the other question of how will such a plan affect the standard of living for those inhabiting the middle of the United States, an area that is mostly agriculture-based. Where will the food be produced if the land is now to be used for solar and wind farms? This question will be discussed in greater detail in a following episode. Since these transmission lines are being proposed to be built first, projects have already been started to build transmission lines where they know for sure there will be large electricity needs. One major transmission line that is being constructed as we speak is the TransWest Express, which aims to transfer 3,000 megawatts from a distance of 700 miles, mainly electricity generated from wind power that will be sent from Wyoming into Las Vegas. Yes, you heard right. Wyoming is to be filled with wind farms in order to supply the electricity needs of Las Vegas, the city of lights, along with its notoriously nefarious economy base. It does not take a huge stretch of the imagination to see what direction this is going. Increasingly, the regions of Middle America, the breadbasket of the United States, will be seen as the energy farms but will be kept relatively energy poor in order to feed the energy-rich regions of the western and eastern coast city metropolis. Increasingly, there will be a greater gap between the energy haves and the energy have-nots, whether one can afford to pay the exorbitant price for the luxury of energy. Not to mention that such a policy outline very clearly shows an intention to decrease food production within the United States. If this seems like a bit of an exaggeration, we only need to look at the case of Beirut in Lebanon. Due to the frequent power outages and blackouts in Beirut, which occur on a regular basis, a market was created where the wealthy and powerful purchased generators that could meet the electricity demands of the average Lebanese person during these blackouts. Thus, most Lebanese people living in Beirut who want reliable electricity need to pay two energy bills one to the city, and about double that amount to a private supplier. These private electricity suppliers are known in Lebanon as the Generator Mafia. You pay two electric bills? As all Lebanese people, we pay two power electric bills. We pay one power electric bill to EDL, and you pay like the double of that to the private generators in general. Let's be frank with this. So the average Lebanese, they need electricity. They need power. They don't need to live in the dark. So they don't care where this comes from. We can't live without electricity for 12 hours a day. So we have to rely on private generators or, or diesel generators, and we can't all afford it. So the idea of having what we call a neighborhood generator evolved. Like every powerful person in the neighborhood will buy a private generator, produce electricity, 
and sell electricity to the neighborhood. That's what we call the generator mafia. This situation in Beirut has become so lucrative for the generator mafia, who also gives payouts to members of government, that there is actually no incentive to correct the problem of an electricity deficit. The government of Beirut, in fact, backs the generator mafia and is content with this arrangement which is lucrative for the few. If you are in a position where you cannot afford to pay electricity from the mafia, you can go for up to 12 hours a day without any electricity. Another striking example of the growing market for energy as a luxury for those who can afford it is the weed market. Marijuana cultivation is the world's single most electricity-intensive agriculture business. Electricity used by the cannabis industry has been increasing sharply over the past several years in the United States, especially for such weed capitals as Colorado, whose almost entire economy is increasingly becoming dependent on weed production. In the case of Colorado, this growth in the cannabis industry has been increasing its electricity demands by about 34% each year. The electricity intensity of cannabis cultivation is 23 times that of a hospital, and about 130 times that of an average American residence. And about 85% of Colorado's electricity comes from coal, oil, or natural gas plants. In 2013, Denver, Colorado was using approximately 100 gigawatts for their legal weed production. This does not factor in the illegal growth that is also occurring. In 2016, this increased to 275 gigawatts. Sales increased by 34% in Denver from 2016 to 2018, which means electricity costs likely also increased by a similar margin, meaning in 2018, Denver would have used approximately 369 gigawatts in electricity for their legal weed sales. In 2020, Colorado's legal marijuana sales doubled from their levels in 2016. To put this into perspective, the electricity consumption for the cannabis industry in just Denver alone in 2016, which is most certainly a great deal larger today, was at the time consuming as much electricity as the entire country of Burundi. The cannabis industry has an image that is very green and of the earth. However, the reality of the cannabis industry is that to meet current demands, electricity directed to cannabis production will exceed the energy use of at least 50% of the world's population in total every year. Recall one fridge uses the same amount of energy as 3 billion people do every year. And 1.5 billion people use one-third the electricity of an average American. How again are we justifying the policy that energy-poor regions should not be allowed to increase their standard of living using coal, oil, or natural gas? How are we justifying that hospitals cannot have access to reliable and affordable energy while the cannabis industry continues to grow at an exponential rate? Is this not horrifically hypocritical? And is this not once again a prime example of how energy use is increasingly being viewed? that the energy-rich countries will be permitted such luxuries, while the energy-poor cannot even have access to adequate energy to power their hospitals and save precious lives, that such policies will be demanding the premature deaths of millions of people, and for what exactly? Certainly not a zero-carbon emissions world. Is this not a very revealing trend we are observing? energy towards electrifying Las Vegas, a generator mafia, and electric economies based off of drug sales. It appears as if the black market is being trumpeted as the savior of the planet. Then there is the matter of electric cars. The future of the auto industry is electric, electric, and battery technology. Electric cars have been heavily promoted as the solution to how the United States can drastically decrease its carbon emissions to meet its 2030 goals. The governor of California, Gavin Newsom, issued an executive order banning the sale of new gas engine vehicles by 2035, requiring all new cars to run on electricity or hydrogen. We will be the first jurisdiction in the world to require 
all new cars to be sold to be alternative fuel cars. 30 countries have joined this pledge, including Britain, Canada, India, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, and Sweden. The United States, China, and Japan have abstained. In addition to this, six major automakers also joined this pledge, including Ford, Mercedes-Benz, General Motors, and Volvo, to phase out sales of new gasoline and diesel-powered vehicles by 2040 worldwide and by 2035 in leading markets. The world has approximately 15 to 18 million electric cars. It could increase to 300 or even 500 million, theoretically, but that would reduce the world's coal, oil, and gas consumption by not even one half of carbon emissions. The reason for this is because electric vehicles cannot replace the functions of airplanes, large transportation ships, and large transportation trucks, including the small diesel-run trucks and equipment needed to mine the rare metals to build the electric cars in the first place. And the more electric cars we build, the more carbon-based fuel we also use. The other problem is that, as already mentioned, all electrical grids need to be backed up by coal, oil, or natural gas energies, if not nuclear or hydro, since renewables are too unreliable to power the grid on their own. Thus, the reality is that electric cars rely on an electrical grid that is mainly supplied by coal, oil, and natural gas, and are otherwise using nuclear or hydro. In order for the electric car industry to exist, you need to mine from somewhere in the world 500,000 pounds of minerals and rock just to make one battery. This mining is mostly done in other countries which pollute their countries. Wherever mining is done, this is an energy-dense process that is entirely reliant on carbon-based fuel. It is especially reliant on diesel-powered vehicles the dirtiest air pollutants. Again, we find that the claim that electric vehicles are going to somehow help us reach a carbon neutral economy by 2050 is just not true. The entire industry base for the electric cars, as well as their energy supply through the grid, is completely reliant presently on coal, oil, and natural gas fuels. In this case, not even nuclear can offset this since you would need nuclear-powered vehicles to do the mining and shipping, which is simply not feasible presently, and this would still not offset the other forms of pollution that come with extensive mining. The reality is electric cars are actually more harmful to the environment than gas-powered vehicles. An electric vehicle has already emitted 10 to 20 tons of carbon dioxide before it even gets to your driveway carbon dioxide that was produced by the mining, manufacturing, and the shipping for said electric vehicle. The first 60,000 miles you drive an electric vehicle, that electric vehicle will have emitted more carbon dioxide than a conventional vehicle. You would have to own the electric vehicle for 100,000 miles before it gives a lower carbon footprint. However, this is assuming you will not need replacement parts, which seems highly unlikely with the track record of electric cars thus far. There are about 16 major areas in the world where most of the mining occurs for the production of renewable energy materials, including for electric cars. In the case of the Democratic Republic of Congo, working conditions are the most notorious in which child slavery is used in running these mines. Once again, we see that the renewable energy market is in fact a major contributor to the disempowerment of Africans. It is not just renewables and electric cars that benefit from these mines. It is also the manufacturers of our computers and our smartphones, something Western society is completely dependent on and one could even say addicted to, with many consumers replacing their laptops and smartphones on a frequent basis. In fact, so-called green companies like Apple encourage this consumer trend. Companies such as Apple have kept a public appearance of being green due to their 100% renewable branding. This is what Alex Epstein had to say about this in his book, Fossil Future. For several years now, Apple has been claiming to great public acclaim 
that it uses 100% renewable sources of energy such as solar and wind for many of its energy needs, including its data centers. This is not remotely true. For one thing, Apple, like everyone else, uses oil for transportation energy to ship its finished products, as well as every material at every stage of its vast supply chain. It uses fossil fuels for industrial heat. When Apple says, powered by, it is disingenuously referring just to electrical power in order to conceal its use of fossil fuels for transportation and heat. And in the realm of electricity, Apple is nowhere near 100% renewable. That would be completely impossible with today's technology and economics. Apple, like nearly every other international technology company in the world, gets most of its electricity from reliable sources such as coal, gas, nuclear, and hydro. How then can Apple claim to be 100% renewable? It purchases a fraudulent 100% renewable status from electricity producers. The basic way this works is that Apple pays utilities to give it credit for the solar and wind that others use and give others the blame for the coal, gas, and nuclear that Apple uses. It's as if Apple CEO Tim Cook were traveling with nine other people on a yacht powered 90% by diesel and 10% by a sail, and Cook claimed that he traveled just using the sail while the others traveled using the diesel. This is energy accounting fraud and dishonestly encourages people to think that 100% renewable innovators like Apple can indeed grow successfully free of carbon energies. And Apple is not the only one who has purchased this facelift. Facebook, Google, Bank of America, and Anhusa Bush are all claiming to be 100% renewable. Once again, we see that it is not really a matter of whether carbon emissions increase or decrease, but more a matter of who can afford to purchase a green energy image. So, are we all doomed? The answer is no, and it is a solution that has rather tragically been staring us all in the face for several decades. The elephant that has been in the room the entire time is nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is by far the most efficient, reliable, safe, and affordable energy source we have available to us presently. For decades, we were told repeatedly that nuclear energy was simply too dangerous, too expensive, and would take too long to build. However, what we are seeing today is that China, Russia, South Korea, and India are swimming in the opposite direction and have recognized that nuclear energy is essential to a clean, stable, and affordable energy future. More recently, countries such as the United States, Canada, France, and Japan are realizing that they cannot afford to shut down all their nuclear energy. However, the pace is still rather sluggish compared to the Chinese, Russian, and Indian financing of 49 out of the 57 nuclear plants being constructed worldwide. This is especially good news for India, who despite the Green New Deal architect Senator Ed Markey, who villainously prevented nuclear fuel from being shipped to India, a setback that kept hundreds of millions of Indian people in the literal dark for decades, India is finally gaining its rightful place in an empowered future. Alex Dimitrios of Space Commune writes, Meanwhile, the world watched as Germany's NLG Vida plan to switch off their nuclear plants and spurn Russian gas resulted in the humiliating destruction of their industrial base and a stunning decision to begin burning coal, wood, and dung to survive through the winter. In a massive turnaround from COP28 goals, 22 countries this past October 2023 declared their intention to triple global nuclear energy capacity by 2050 in the name of net zero. This trend seems to have been largely, if not entirely, due to the fact that China, Russia, and India are finally in a position to choose a nuclear energy future for themselves that is now beyond the policing of the West. 
And because nuclear energy will, in fact, greatly boost their energy economies, which again, as we have been discussing throughout this episode, means a massive boost to their living standard and future possibilities, the West is in a position where it cannot afford to find itself lagging too far behind. It appears the West was fine being nuclear energy free if all of its competitors were also nuclear energy free, whether by choice or not. In other words, it appears the West was fine promoting an energy outline that was to further deprive most of the world from becoming energy rich economies. However, if the West were to continue to ban and shut out nuclear energy, while China, Russia, and India continued to increase nuclear energy, this would mean that the West would fast become an energy poor region of the world in relation to these Asian giants. And as we have made the case thus far, it is the energy rich nations of the world who can achieve empowerment for themselves and help other parts of the world achieve this as well. In fact, this explains what would otherwise be entirely inexplicable, the banned U2's sudden, complete reversal on nuclear energy. Going from this... ...to this... So even fission, which is you know, yeah. regular nuclear energy, is getting safer and smarter. And we've campaigned yeah. against nuclear energy, and we've kind of turned around a little bit on that one. And so the lyric, Atomic Sun for everyone, that's that reference. Remarkably, the environment is being used as their main reason for supporting nuclear energy. In the past, the environment was their reason for opposing it. This is all to mask the real purpose of anti-nuclear advocacy, that it was always about who had the control. It looks like the subject of nuclear energy was always a political one for those controlling policy in the West. It will be necessary to reevaluate our assumptions about nuclear energy and its relationship to humanity and nature as a whole if we truly wish to navigate out of the eye of this storm while there is still time. <laughs>